Well, good morning again. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you want to be finding Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in the, uh, about the middle of Luke chapter 1. Uh, I wanted to find a word for you this morning before we begin. And it is a word, this is kind of a two-part sermon. We're going to start this mo- morning, we're going to finish this evening. Uh, don't worry, I am going to take a break so you can go home and eat. So, uh, But the word I wanted to find for you is a word, I think you will agree with me, For those of you that have served Christ for more than a few years, what's, you know, we we always say we get peace when when we live for God, but what's the, there is a word that the longer you live, the more you realize you can do this of God, and that is trusting. Trust. It is a firm belief in reliability truth ability or strength of someone or something you know i I began to think i believe this is going on our seventh year here uh and when i first come you didn't really i mean i i'd known some of you for quite a while but you didn't really know me and i didn't really know you as in the church setting so you know i thought you just trusted that when you invited me here that I didn't bring snakes in my box and bring them out and hand them out weekly. I'd have probably been a one-week tenure. <laughs> probably wouldn't have been invited back. But I hope, my prayer is, that through this time, you have gained some trust that when I bring a message to you, number one, I, I heard it said one time about a preacher that he preached the whole sermon and never mentioned the Bible verse. I've got a problem with that. <laughs> I believe it ought to come out of Scripture. Uh, and if I start giving you a message that's not out of Scripture, then you can show me the way down the road. But I hope you trust at least some now that that what I'm giving you, I, I firmly believe in my heart, is what God has put on me to give you. you know, and I thought about trust. <laughs> Does trust come immediately on earth? We have to earn it, don't we? You know, and I thought, my oldest, she'll tell a story about one day when we lived right down here, uh, Dickie and Melita invited us over to swim in the pool. And so she was up on the side and she was going to jump in. Well, she jumped in and I'd caught her a few times. Well, I decided to let her go under, to let her feel how it was. And so she did and she got mad and, but... Then eventually she started jumping and me catching her again. Years later, I found out <laughs> how deeply that scarred my oldest child. She didn't know she didn't know if she could trust me all the time. But trust. Would you agree with me that if we do something long enough, that people then begin to trust us to do it, girls? In our whole life, would you trust me to be early or late? Early. There's only two times, and that's early or or late. There's no on time. We've talked about that. But through my actions, they have learned to trust that I will be there before time. I hope through our actions and your actions that people, they see us, I hope that they know they can trust us to be godly <laughs> all the time. How many of us this morning fall short of that besides your pastor? But I want people to be able to trust us in a situation to know that we're going to react like God and that trust. I want to give you eight examples straight out of the straight out of the Bible of different kind of trust. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they are John the Baptist's parents. They trusted God when a, when a longing was unfulfilled in their lives. The woman who was healed of the issue of blood, she trusted God, and she was taking risks despite the pain. David trusted God when life did not look how he pictured it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God when there no matter of the outcome. 
Naomi and Ruth trusted God when you feel alone. Esther, trust God when you're afraid. Jacob, trust God when you've messed up. And lastly, Moses, trust God when it looks like there is no way out. <laughs> if you're a child of God this morning, I've got great news for you. You don't have to fear, you don't have to doubt, and you don't have to worry. But how many of us, let's just be honest before we move on, does fear, doubt, and worry creep into our lives sometimes? Amen? Now listen to me. This only applies to a born-again child of God. If you are not saved this morning, I cannot, you cannot stand on this promise. Also, if you stand on this promise, I want you to know this also does not apply to if something's bothering you and it's somebody and they are not a child of God, it does not apply to them. You must know that. That is the truth. Now, but what about you? This morning, if you're born again, if you're saved, and all that means, in case you don't know, all that means is you admit that you have sin, that you're a sinner. And folks, every one of us in this room, everyone who's ever been born except Jesus Christ is a sinner. And it comes to a point in our life, it come to me, in my 30s, and I said, God, I, I don't want this anymore. I don't want, I don't want to be, and, I, and I'm not saying you quit sinning, don't misunderstand me, but I knew I needed saved. I knew I wanted to go to heaven when I die because there's only two options, and that's heaven and hell. And I knew I wanted to go to heaven, and the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and his blood and asking him to forgive you and then re repenting or turning from your sin. But you see... I don't want to jump into tonight's, but tonight's about suffering and why we suffer. Well, guess what? We suffer so that we can learn what? That we can trust God to deliver us. Is there anybody in this room that God has never delivered? Of course not. You're sitting here. Some of you may be going through something right now. Listen to me. God will deliver you. It may not be on your timetable. It may not even end the way that you think in your mind that you want it to. But it will end better. God says if we will trust and believe in him, he can turn all things out to work for our good. Amen? But you see, do you believe today that God can do anything he desires. Well, let, well, it, that's a little weak. Can we try it again? Do you believe that the, the one who created everything, the earth, the moon, the stars, the sun, do you believe that he can do anything he wants to do? Amen. That's better. Now, if we believe that, hmm, do you believe he loves you this morning? then somebody tell me one thing that should worry you about you. Now, you want me to tell you something that we need to worry about? And, and really, there's no need to worry about it because we can't change it. So what we need to do is pray about it, and that's lost loved ones and lost friends. Amen? Can we, if, if, if we could save other people, how many in here would your grandma and your grandpa have saved you? Or your mom or your dad. They would have done it, right? And how many would, would you have saved your kids and your grandkids? We would do that. Can we do that? We cannot do that. Does it do us any good to stay up all night worrying about it? How about praying? That's where you make the difference, folks. You know what? I, you know, this is just my opinion, but I believe I can back it up scriptural. My prayers... Since I don't have a son, I'll use it this way. I've got a son-in-law, and I'm working on him. He's still got this Razorback thing, but I'm, I'm praying for him. <laughs> Say my boy was born, and he was just gone. He was trouble, all that, and I pray for him. Can I pray him into heaven? 
But let me tell you what I do believe my prayers can do. Hmm. I believe my prayers can get him extra knocks by God on his heart's door. Amen? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Folks, number one, that ought to be a that ought to be an incentive to us to live righteously. Because we want our prayers to carry a lot of weight. Amen? And I believe that if we love somebody and they're lost and we continue to pray for them, that do you believe the Holy Spirit can convict? Amen. How many of you was convicted by the Holy Spirit when you got saved? Every one of you. I can remember sitting in church wanting to crawl out the back door before. Matter of fact, I went to the bathroom one time and didn't come back. And I was in the church service one time where they were playing... Uh, when the saints go marching in. And before I know it, they had me up marching around the church. What they didn't know is when we got back there by the back door, I marched right out the door. I left the saints marching, and I went to the parking lot. That conviction is strong. Praise God. Anybody in here besides the pastor stubborn? <laughs> Thick-headed? You didn't have to point to him, Amy. I already I knew that. We were cut out of the same cloth. But how many of you, sometimes it takes repeated action to learn something? Well, folks, I believe in repeated conviction by the Holy Spirit. And I believe those, those loved ones we have that we're, that we're praying for, I believe they're going to be delivered. I believe they're going to be saved because I believe our prayers are being heard and I believe the Holy Spirit is convicting and I believe we're going to see change. Amen? And now I'll go to my grave believing that. But here's the thing before we get into Scripture. And that's Luke chapter 1, if you'll be putting your finger on verse 37. I've heard people say they can't memorize Scripture. Well, this is one we ought to memorize today. And it's short, so it ought to be easy for us to memorize. But you see, I've heard you today tell me that you believe God can do anything and you believe God loves you. Folks, that ought to change your life every day. Because how many this morning with an amen have troubles in your life? Amen? I had a troublesome day yesterday. And God delivered me today. <laughs> I was sitting on the couch yesterday. I'm not ashamed to tell you. I was a little out of it on some pain pills. And I had a good friend call me, and I, I, we probably talked for an hour, didn't we? And I kept looking at Jen like, I'm going to pass out. And, you know, and I'd raise the phone up, I don't know how much longer I can talk, I'm fixing to pass, because I was feeling no pain at that point. <laughs> but I want you to know this morning, I trusted God. I knew, <laughs> tongue in cheek, I knew it would pass. <laughs> I'm talking about your troubles. I was talking about a kidney stone. <laughs> I knew it would pass. But you know what? A kidney stone is no different than your problems. They'll pass. The storms pass. The trials pass. But I want you to hang on before I read this scripture to you. Hang on to what you told me just a minute ago. God can do anything and God loves you. If you would, when you find Luke chapter 1 verse 37, please stand this morning for the reading of God's word. And when you leave here today, I want you to memorize this verse. It's very easy to memorize, and we need to tell it to ourselves every day. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful Sunday school lesson, Lord, and the messenger you blessed us with to send it to us. Lord, we just praise you. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful songs, Lord, and the children standing and doing work in your house. And God, we thank you this morning for reminding us, Lord, that number one, you love us, and number two, all things are possible through you. God, forgive us for our doubt. God, forgive us for our fear, and forgive us for our worry. God, you know us, and Lord, we just pray today that you'd touch us, Lord. And now it comes the preaching of your word. And Lord, I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins, Lord. Please cleanse me and prepare me to speak your holy word. 
And God, I just pray today for forgiveness on all listening. Lord, that you would open up our ears, Lord, and Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and discernment to understand, Lord, and apply it to our lives. And I just pray that we would be what you called us to be so we can lead others to you. And in Jesus' precious holy name, his children all prayed. Amen. I want you to go home today saying, For with God nothing shall be impossible. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And, and then you can go to Philippians 4.13. For through, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now we've tied ourselves to God. It says here that with God nothing shall be impossible. Well, what about when we tie ourselves to God? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You see, we're not supposed to hate, but you know what? I hate the enemy. I had several phone calls this week from some, some of you sitting in this room and some that wasn't in this room today, and I saw what the enemy was doing in their lives. Every call seemed to be something different, but I said, you know what? The enemy is behind every one of these calls. I could see it. I asked for spiritual discernment in each matter, and I could see how the enemy was attacking each one of these people that I love and, 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 and how he's and how he's going about it. You see that the devil is the father of all lies. Number one, church, you've got to remember he is a liar. And he wants, if, he wants you <clears throat> afraid. He wants you doubting. He wants you worried. Why? Because if you are those things, are you out proclaiming the gospel of Christ? No. And another thing, are we supposed to be like the world or are we supposed to be different? We're supposed to be different. We're not supposed to see things the way the world sees things. Folks, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure you better get ready for the rapture because Miss Virginia is cold, and I've never seen that before. <laughs> so maybe something's fixing to happen. Now, let me get back on track. <laughs> the devil wants us defeated. He wants us downtrodden. I wish I could remember... Oh, Lord, it's been a long time since I was a kid. But there was a saying, uh, somebody was always downtrodden. There was a name we had for that. Uh, but I ask you this a lot. But are we supposed to walk around as children of, of the one true king the, with our sins forgiven? Are we supposed to walk around with our head down, kicking our feet, being ugly and mad? If we do that, what are we selling, what are we advertising to the world that we're just like them? And guess what? We are. The only difference is we've met Jesus Christ and he's forgiven us of our sins. And that ought to put joy in our heart. For all of you Beverly Hillbillies fans, you remember when Granny would drink her tonic and she'd sing, I got joy, joy, joy down in my heart because she was lit. We ought to be lit for God, amen? We ought to be that excited. We ought to, you know, there's nothing that we should fear. <laughs> but the devil, he lies to us. Satan likes to make our situations seem impossible, amen? I'm just going to use you some examples that I know. Satan wants you to make... Satan wants you to believe that that report you're waiting on is going to be bad. Satan wants you to believe that that bill that you've got coming in that you don't have the money in your account yet for, he wants to make you think that's over, it's done. <laughs> Satan wants to make you think that that plane you're climbing on is going to crash. <laughs> Satan wants you to have doubt, fear. And God says, no place in my child is there for doubt and fear. Amen? He did not give us the spirit of fear. Amen? So let me tell you something. If you have that in you this morning, and folks, let's be honest, that sometimes we all do. But I'm telling you this morning, we can evict that out of our lives because we are children of the one true king. Amen? And I'm going to tell you something. Even if you're on a plane, 
and your engine goes out. Do you think God can set that plane down and not hurt a soul? Amen, he can. If the doctor comes in and tells you you got stage 4 cancer, can God heal you with the breath of his mouth? Amen. Folks, if the banker says we're going to repossess everything you've got, you don't have enough money, can God fix that situation? Amen. But here's the other thing. Here's why we trust God. Even if, <clears throat> even if, can you say that with me this morning? Even if God says no, even if God does not heal you from stage four, even if God does not prevent the, the taking of your stuff, God will deliver you through both. Amen? But you see, Satan, Satan wants us focused on here and now. Let me ask you something. Have you ever prayed for somebody to be healed and then they died? Everybody in this room, amen? Did God fail? Folks, I was thinking this morning as I was listening to Sunday school lesson, if he would let us glimpse heaven. Y'all were talking about selling all your possessions and seeking the kingdom of God. Let me ask you something. If we could glimpse heaven, do you think we would treasure anything down here at all? It would not bother us at all one second to sell everything we got and, and do whatever. Because what's up there is far greater than what's down here. But you see, I want to take you in Scripture and read you a story that you're very familiar with, but I want to look at it a little bit differently today. And it's in John chapter 6. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And there's a couple things in here I want to point out to you about trusting God. And I'm going to talk to you today about somebody in that story I bet you've never been talked to about. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But John chapter 6, and I'm going to start in verse 1. And I want, to, I want you to remember about trust. I read you all the characters in the Bible, how they had trusted God. Well, listen to this. John chapter 6 and verse 1. I want you, let me set the stage for you. It's almost Passover. So all the Jews have come to this area. So there is a large number of people in the area. Jesus is teaching and he's been healing people. And people have been seeing this. So you have a, you have a huge crowd of people. And they're seeing, they're seeing Jesus heal people of physical diseases. So they're wanting to draw close to Jesus. They're wanting to get more. They're wanting to find out more. So that's where we're at. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? I want you to know. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He's showing Philip who he is. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Here's where we're going to get excited. One of his disciples, Andrew, which is Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Hmm. Folks, let me tell you something. We got a little bit of Andrew in us. Every one of us got a little bit of Andrew in us. I hope you see right there, Andrew asked the wrong question. Andrew said, we've got two, five barley loaves and two small fishes, what are we going to do? How many of you ever got a report from the doctor? This and this, what am I going to do? Or you got financial situation, it looks, but what am, I go what am I going to do? What Andrew should have said, and what we should say every time, is, Lord, we've got five loaves and two fishes, what are you going to do? Amen. God, the doctor says, this report says this. What are you going to do? How are you going to reveal yourself in this? Folks, Andrew was looking through worldly eyes. <laughs> 
He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We live in a different area, folks. We live under the grace and the blessing of Jesus Christ. Amen? He does think. How many remembers the story about the widow and the barrel? He kept filling it day after day after day. How many has in this room has he been blessing day after day? Folks, if you are a child of God, you will not run out. Amen? It may get low, and you may think, I'm going to run out, but it will not run out. Amen? Andrew says, this is all we got. What are we going to do? Well, let's pick it up. Let's pick it up in verse 10. And Jesus said, Make the men set down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number about 5,000. I want to stop here. I know you know this, but that's just 5,000 men. That's not counting the women and the children. So there is no idea how many people are here. It could be as many as ten to 12,000 people. And Jesus took the loaves, and what did he do first? And when he had given thanks. Folks, how many in the world was fixing to feed that many people, 10,000 people would have gave thanks for five loaves and two fishes? They'd have been wanting to know where to order Little Caesars. How can I get some pizza in here? But Jesus thanked God for what he had. How many of us today need to thank God for what we have? Amen? So he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. You ever wondered why there was 12 baskets full? One for each disciple. That disciple knew that if I follow God, my basket, even though the world may look at it and tell me it's getting empty, will always have more than I need. Amen? But you see, here's the part of the story. I've never heard, I've never heard this talked about, but I want to talk to you about it today. There's a hero in this story who gives us how we should live, and he's only addressed one time his name is not given and he's only described as a lad you ever thought about the lad that had the fish and the loaves i heard it put like this that jesus walked over to him and knelt down beside him and said son may i have your lunch may i have your food and you know what the lad did? The lad gave Jesus everything he had. He surrendered his whole lunch to God. And God fed over 10,000 people with a young lad's lunch. You may be sitting here today, and you may think, well, I'm not educated. I don't speak well. I don't do this. I don't do that. Folks, let me tell you something. If you will surrender all, to Jesus Christ, there's no telling how many people he could spiritually feed through you. Amen? We tend to look at ourselves and we judge ourselves through the world's eyes. God doesn't do that. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Folks, we need, and it, it starts right here with your pastor. I'm telling you, I need to totally surrender my life to Jesus. I heard y'all talking about it in Sunday school this morning. Uh, focus. Uh, folks, if we're honest this morning, and I want us to be, I think we could all focus more on God than we do. Amen? I think we could all read more, pray more, love more, share more. This world is a world of hatred. Uh, everybody fighting. Everybody, Folks, Jesus Christ is love. Now, we don't have to agree with everybody, but we do have to love everybody, amen? And we need to show them how grateful we are that God forgave us of our sins. 
We're not better than anybody else, folks. You're not better than anybody else. That's the one thing I tried to, that's one of the things I tried to instill in my girls when they were little. That nobody on this earth is better than you, and you're better than nobody on this earth. We're all sent here, and we all have an opportunity to live for God. You either choose to live for God, or you choose not to live for God. One leads you to heaven, and one leads you to hell. But the little boy, he gave it all to Jesus. So let's, as I read to you, that's what happened after he surrendered everything. Jesus, when all hope was lost, Jesus fed them. And at the end, therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets. They had some left over. As I get ready to close, I want you to know this morning, you may have doubts in your mind right now, and you may have trouble in your life, and I know, I know you do, because we all do. But that's why you can live confident, comfort, comfortable, peaceful lives, no matter what you're facing. Is there anybody in here with an amen that has absolutely no troubles or trials right now? By your silence, I'm going to assume every one of us has some kind of trouble or some kind of trial. If you're currently going through a beautiful patch, praise God, because your valley's coming. If you're currently in the valley, praise God, because your beautiful day's coming. But folks, if you'll come back tonight, I'm going to tell you why you praise God in that valley and why you should enjoy and rejoice being in that valley. Anybody in here ever went through a valley in your life? Amen. How many know that if you live any amount of time, you're going to go through another one and another one and another one? In the book of Psalms, it talks about the valley of Baca, which is tears. Folks, if you've ever lost a loved one, you've went through the valley of Baca. If you've ever had your heart broke, you've went through the valley of Baca. The deepest I was ever in that valley is when I thought I had failed to witness to a loved one who died and I thought they were in hell because of my failure to witness to them. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that is the lowest I have ever been in my life and I walked through the valley of Baca. But because I trusted God, he grabbed my hand and he led me out on the other side. Folks, he will do the same thing for you. Do not turn loose of God's hand. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark it gets, know this, that he loves you and that he can do all things. That's why I told you to memorize the scripture today. Here's another one that we can memorize because it's short. And it is so powerful. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by faith. Sight. Folks, that sums up the whole message this morning in one verse. If you live your life trusting God, no matter what you see, no matter what's going on, you're living by faith, not by sight. And how many this morning, with an amen, believe that God's got you? Amen. Folks, he does. Now listen to me. If you're under the sound of my voice this morning and you've never made him the Lord of your life, you've never asked him to forgive you your sins, you've never invited him into your heart, everything I said this morning does not apply to you. But I've got great news. All you've got to do is ask him and then live for him. That's it. He's, made, he's done the hard part. He was hung on that cross with nails in his hands and in his feet. He was whipped. He was brutalized. And he had every sin that you ever committed, every sin that I've ever committed, every sin that anybody's ever committed, put on his soul. And folks, that hurt Jesus far more than the nails through his hands and his feet. And all you've got to do today is the Bible says confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. What that means is confess Jesus Christ with your, that you need a Savior and that you're a sinner. And then by believing... You understand, if you believe him, then you live for him. It goes hand in hand. My prayer for you this morning is that when we leave here today, 
I know that doubt, worry, and fear will probably creep into your lives at some point, but what I pray is it don't stay as long. When it creeps in, I pray you evict it through the promises that you've been told today that Jesus Christ has you and that we can all live a joyful life and we can worry less, we can, we can be depressed less, that we'd have that joy. And folks, I want you to know before I close, it is 100% up to you. It is your decision how you live. If you live with Jesus, folks, you'll have joy in your heart and you can take the doubt and the worry and the fear and you can cast it off. But if you choose to live without him, that's going to be a lifetime. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'd ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with no one looking around. I just want to ask you this morning, do you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you been saved? Is your name written down in the Lamb's book of life? Do you know that if you quit breathing right now, if you died today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Would it be heaven or would it be hell? If you're not sure of heaven, friend, today is the day to make it right. Today is the day to give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. And no matter what your sins, no matter what any of us has done, he, oh, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Don't let the enemy tell you that he won't forgive you because he will. If you're under the sound of my voice this morning and you're not saved, but you want me to pray for you, just with a quick uplifted hand and back down, I'll see your hand and then I'll pray for you. Not out loud, I'm not going to embarrass you, but in my quiet time, I want to pray for you to have things right with God. If you're here this morning and you have worry, doubt, or fear in your life about anything and you want to cast that at the feet of Jesus Christ, my Bible tells me that there's power in prayer and that when we join together and pray, we can see the hand of God move. If there's something this morning that you want to lay at the feet of Jesus Christ, that you want off your shoulders, that you're tired of carrying this morning, if you want to bring it to this altar and pray to him, he'll carry it for you. He'll take it away. And don't go back and pick it up again. Leave it at his feet, and he's a loving father, and he'll take it from you.